our panel discussion. And we have four very distinguished panelists who very kindly agreed to reflect on what they've heard, including in the last session uh, with us, um, and uh, talk a little bit about how what they've heard from the TESAF projects and from our synthesis work relates to global agendas that they are familiar with and involved in. And um, the, the details, the biographical details of the panel, the panel members, uh, I think Rosie has posted those in the chat. Um, so you'll be able to see in more detail uh, who is who. Um, but uh, just to say very briefly that uh, Keith Holmes, uh, who is, is, uh, works within the UNESCO Futures of Learning and Innovation team, and he's a focal point for the Education Research and Foresight Program, which reinforces UNESCO's observatory function in education. And Keith has been playing a leading role in the whole Futures of Learning initiative. So we're delighted and honored, Keith, you're able to join us and reflect from that uh, position with us today. And uh, Moira Fall uh, is originally from Zimbabwe. She is a senior lecturer at the Geneva Graduate Institute and the executive director of NORAG, um, which is a global network of uh, people interested in international education development. Um, she, uh, she, and she, she is particularly interested in issues of uh, complex systems, decolonization, power, and spaces between fields. And Professor Varghese is, a, uh, is, is the uh, currently a distinguished visiting professor at the Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay. Uh, he's also a former vice chancellor of the National University of Educational Planning Administration in New Delhi and a founding director of the Center for Policy Research in Higher Education, New Delhi. So uh, really extremely well placed to, to comment on uh, the implications of TESEF's work for uh, the Indian and South Asian context. And uh, 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 Pezi uh, Ogbuigwe is a member of our advisory group from the outset. She's been a uh, staunch supporter of TESEF's work and champion for our work and voice for our work. And uh, we're extremely grateful for all of that, Akpezi. She is a respected and high profile expert in transformational change in higher education in Africa, in environmental law. She comes from a legal background in environmental education and climate change education. So each of these panelists will be invited to speak for four minutes initially um, about how these different, uh, what they've heard today relates to their area of work. So Keith, I'll start off with you and perhaps you could just, uh, uh, just, a, just let us, uh, perhaps you could share your thoughts about how what you've heard about TESEF relates to the futures of education, the futures of learning work that you and the, the rest of the team at UNESCO are leading on. So your four minutes starts now, Keith, over to you. Well, thank you so much, Leon, and thanks uh, to the whole team for inviting UNESCO's Future of Learning and Innovation team to this uh, wonderful event, really, and a, a very important event. Um, in fact, uh, hearing from all the interesting discussions uh, suggests to me we're, we're also hearing something about the future of research itself, um, a, an exciting avenue uh, for research in education and beyond for the future. Uh, and really the teams uh, have, have done such a great job at interpreting and translating what post-colonial theory might actually mean for research and research processes, the collaborative research partnerships, and of course the, the lived experiences. Um, concerning the engagement with the Futures of Education report uh, published by the International Commission on the Futures of Education, actually it's been a two-way process. The, the, the TESF and the work of the UNESCO chair in Bristol um, has really contributed to uh, the international debate on the futures of education. Uh, there's a great deal of resonance, in fact, uh, between some of the sections of the report, which is called Reimagining Our Futures Together, a new social contract for education, and the work that we've been hearing about today. Uh, like the TESF projects, the International Commission really invites engagement and dialogue about the futures to advance social, ecological, environmental, 
and also epistemic justice. Uh, actually, the International Commission is issued a call for a new research agenda for education, uh, which is a, a really a future-oriented, uh, planet-wide learning process uh, on our futures together, drawing on diverse forms of knowledge and perspective, uh, seeing insights uh, from different and diverse resources and sources as, as complementary. Um, so, um, well, congratulations really to the, to the whole team for the progress uh, made already. Um, I think I just want to refer to a couple of examples, you know, where we've tried to uh, take up some of the issues that uh, have been worked on in the four countries, and uh, also to think about them, you know, from a more international perspective, uh, taking account uh, what would it mean, you know, to, to take a planetary wide uh, global uh, view uh, on, on these, these issues, uh, noting that really national um, research agendas, national research funding, uh, the national organization of research probably falls short of what is needed uh, in the current uh, eco-technological kind of crisis situation uh, that the world is in uh, today. Uh, so some of you may have heard that there was a uh, important international conference uh, on uh, knowledge, transforming knowledge for just and sustainable futures. And the uh, keynote speaker was Professor Achil Mbembe, uh, who really articulated very well uh, that the uh, humanity <laughs> is in need of a new way of thinking, you know, commensurate with the planet. Um, that uh, current uh, ways of knowing and thinking, uh, sometimes at the expense of others, cannot be sufficient, you know, considering the complexity of today's challenges. So he calls for a new planetary consciousness, which is not about universalism, but constituted of, and needs to draw upon the archive du monde, the archives of the world, humanity's knowledge, uh, to be um, consistent and building up, uh, you know, the, 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 the knowledge of humanity in the face of today's problems. So calling for transdisciplinarity, perhaps going beyond interdisciplinarity, for the transformation of education and society in harmony with the living planet. So I think uh, we would be very happy to have an ongoing conversation. You know, what would it mean for a UNESCO research agenda on rethinking knowledge and research? How might you and your partners contribute to that process? And what would it mean for better international cooperation by research funders and those who are setting research agendas? Uh, looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Keith, for, for, for that. Uh, very provocative uh, and uh, very useful to hear how you're setting our work within this broader agenda. So thank you. Um, all right, I'll, I'll pass over now to, uh, to Moira. Moira, perhaps you could uh, reflect a little on how you feel our work relates to your ongoing interest in decolonizing research from your position in NORAG. Thank you, uh, Leon, and thank you for to all of you for the invitation to speak today. and also the invitation to listen to everything that's gone ahead. This has been inspiring as well as um, really thought provoking in terms of what it is that this could mean in terms of the actual work that's being done now and also um, what can be done in the future. And in terms of how it is that we are working on this, it's really a reflection on our place and role in the discussion on development that is unfolding in several parts of the world and how we might actually take that forward in generative ways. And generative here, really thinking about how this actually is about sustaining life in the broader sense of the term and also our capacities to respond to its needs, the needs of life. And fundamentally, in the recognition that we are at an inflection point, inflection point is probably the, uh, the least um, alarmist way that we can think about the state of the world that we are in and that we are also leaving for, um, for future generations. And really in terms of this, um, the work that has been done, I think it's going to be really fascinating to see how it is that these kinds of processes um, can be applied to other agendas. Um, and those agendas obviously coming from the, the people and the places where the work is being done. And also just to pick up on something that Rona mentioned in her, um, in her presentation, we have a great deal of work in education on pedagogy of the oppressed. 
is there work that could be continued also in terms of a pedagogy of the oppressor, whether it's deliberate or not deliberate oppression, but actually how do we think about remaking remaking these power relations? How do we actually work with those who have power, who work with power in order to actually get it to be wielded in a useful and positive way or yielded more importantly? And, you know, in research, it's not about holding on to this idea of data being raw materials that are collected in the South and then manufactured in the North, but actually making sure that that is as far from our practice as it could possibly be, and how we then represent our work going forward. So, you know, in terms of NORAG's work last year and our um in our annual report, we were very proud that 100% of our knowledge products and activities included experts from underrepresented groups. And that's something that is a metric that we are holding ourselves to in terms of thinking about the seats at the table, who is represented and also which knowledges are underrepresented as well. And I think you've touched on in really useful ways this idea of complexity and systems thinking and systems approaches. In the last couple of years, we have seen a lot of people talking about systems and moving from sector to systems when talking about education. Unfortunately, in the vast majority of these cases, it feels like someone's done control F in a document find sector and just global replace with system because the solutions that are being produced are not systemic. The relationships that are being actually talked about are not addressing some of those systemic issues that need to be that you have raised. And one of the things from last year that I was most proud of was a quote from one individual in one activity that we did in Pakistan who said, that the activity that we ran through our KICS um, project, uh, we host the hub for Europe, Asia and Pacific, and that this activity helped them realize that it's not just about research and knowledge and expertise in English from renowned organizations, but actually they realized that their knowledge was valid and that they could contribute a lot to their education system and beyond. And these are the kinds of, these are the kinds of work that I can see is coming through in your projects as well. And it's fascinating to be part of this conversation and I look forward to going forward with it. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Moira. That was uh, wonderful uh, and, and uh, uh, very uh, uh, stimulating uh, intervention. Thank you so much. Um, okay, I'd like to uh, uh, pass over to Professor Varghese, uh, please, if you would be kind enough to share your, your reflections. Uh, you're on mute, Professor. You're on mute. Oh, can you hear me now? Ah, okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. It was really an academically rewarding and a great learning experience listening to all the people. And I think this is a new pathway of looking at research and trying to generate knowledge in the sense in which Tessa is talking about it. I think it is, we in the 1990s, we were more familiar with the mode one knowledge production and mode two knowledge production. And people were talking in terms of moving away from knowledge mode one to mode two. I think this also comes under the broader category of mode two knowledge production that is taking place. What is also equally important is that it recognizes the local knowledge, importance of indigenous knowledge, local knowledge in the process of decision making. But essentially, with all the arrangements that we make, the institutions remain unchanging and the difficulty is that this changing cultural context in which education should take place is facing a challenge when confronted with the educational institutions, which are not changed. The teachers, which are more traditional rather than ready to change with this, you know. So I feel that 
two issues I was going through the some of the case studies of all the four countries that you presented. I think one thing that emerges very closely is that the issues related to diversity and inequality to be addressed more closely for the future. What do I mean by that? The point is that once the system is expanding and education is reaching to the unreached groups, the institutions become more diverse and the institutions are failing to respond to this diversity that is taking place. And as a result of that, the inequalities not between those who are inside the schools and outside the schools, but those who are with the schools and colleges is widening. And this has a lot to do with the intervention strategies at the teaching learning processes, at the institutional level and at the administration level. So this becomes one of the important dimensions when I look into all the four, four countries, you know, that for, for which I had limited information from the studies that you've done. So you have highlighted a very important dimension, but at the same time, it is also equally important to go further in that. Or put it in a mature, Gordon uh, Brown's uh, one, what do we understand by progressive universalism? and how this will be implemented in terms of sustainable development. That becomes a, one of the important challenges. Rather than talking about absolute changes and absolute progresses, how do we, how are we in a position to talk about the learning differentials which are widening? How do we converge the learning differentials? That becomes an important, that is the place where local interventions and local images are important. What is emerging very widely in many countries is that the national priorities are in conflicting with the local realities. So how do we try to bring together? I think your efforts will be a great achievement in moving in that direction. You know, And I hope that uh, this will be one of the ways in which you will be able to do that. I end with one comment. Many of the conclusions that you are drawing needs a decision. But what is not clear from the research test of research is that, where is that decision-making point that you have in mind? I think that is a part, I think, is something that needs to be done because all the conclusions come to, all the studies come to the conclusion that there is a different way of allocating resources or teaching learning, encouraging teaching learning processes, et cetera. But where is this decision point? But when you talk about financing, when you talk about funding, when you talk about it, all these are today centralized. So are you talking about a centralized financing arrangement, a centralized administrative arrangement, a centralized managerial arrangement, and a decentralized localized one? You know That part is, I think, from the future research, perhaps there is a need for giving more attention by TESF that will take the your research and the initiative that you have uh, done already to a much larger scale and in a more relevant way. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Varghese. That's a really uh, a, a thought provoking um, set of points and, and also for the challenge at the end there as well. I think um, that's a very important point for us to reflect on. And perhaps it does uh, draw attention to how we can get uh, people at, that, at those decision points to take heed of this kind of research. So thank you very much for that. Okay, um, I'd like to uh, conclude with uh, inviting um, Pezzi, please, to uh, reflect on your thoughts on what you've heard. Over to you, Pezzi. Thank you, Leon, and thank you, everyone that is here. Uh, I've, I've learned so much, and um, today's legacy conference has revived my commitment to education and research for the sustainable future we are looking at. You know, giving it a relevant, equitable, and relational face. Um, and I think for the African continent. Um, they would amount to a win-win. Uh, um, firstly, using the learnings from TESA would lead to a revival of the way we learn, inclusivity um, and, and contextually relevant education involving students, educators, parents, elders, and community members. 
in the educational process. An African adage puts it like this. It says, um, it takes a village to train a child. And I think this research is an example, a practical example, you know, how that comes about. Um, Tessa projects also led to the empowerment of communities. We see it from the stories that we're told. You know, local people empowering local leaders, teachers, traders, young people. And there are so many projects, I mean, like the Climate Action in Context Project in Somaliland and others, they illustrate, illustrate these things very well. And secondly, um, co-creation of knowledge was practically exhibited in all the projects. The results would inject ingenious African indigenous knowledge and community education to transform the global education discourse. And um, I think that this has the potential of enhancing the inclusion of diverse cultural perspectives and ways of knowing in global processes, such as the value of local knowledge systems, languages, history, and cultural practices, which would provide a more comprehensive and balanced understanding of the world. You know, many of the projects from Rwanda, South Africa, and Somaliland, you know, showcased how indigenous knowledge systems often have a strong emphasis on sustainable practices and environmental stewardship. They showcase holistic approaches to learning that encompass spiritual, social, environmental, and cultural dimensions. By integrating these perspectives into the global education system, students can develop a deeper understanding of ecological inter interconnectedness, sustainable resource management, and the importance of living in harmony in communities with the natural world and with ourselves. This will promote a deeper appreciation of the interdependence between humans, interdependence between us, nature, social justice issues, and the broader world. And let me just conclude by just sharing a, an example of one of the projects, the Makanda um, Ngoku. You know, that project was partly a response to the feeling of alienation young people felt in the conversation about land and restitution, which had recently dominated South Africa's public discourse. The project amplified the voices of the youth of Makanda in how they thought about sustainable cities, particularly their own city. The project investigators used educational approaches locating the conversation in the period before the colonial encounter and throughout the colonial period. They pushed the participants to think sideways and, and to center knowledge that were overlooked, such as oral histories through grandparents. This project found out that most of these youths had no clue about the history of the town called Makanda how it was constituted and the violence and resistance that informed the process. They had been disconnected from their history. Another African adage says, it is not a taboo to go back and fetch what you forgot, emphasizing the importance of learning from the past, from our culture, from our own culture, you know, to build the future we want. Thank you. That's marvelous, uh, Pezzi, really powerful and uh, a really fitting uh, 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 contribution. Uh, thank you, thank you so, so much for that. Okay, um, we can take some questions for the panelists, if there are any uh, that people would like to, to ask. Uh, please do pop them in the chat or raise your hand. Um, we've got a comment in the meantime, from uh, from uh, from Ronica, um, who says thanks so much for the links. This work is incredibly worthwhile because it eschews the monolithic view of knowledge. Uh, Professor Varghese is correct. Institutions hesitate to change. Um, so uh, so some uh, some important uh, observations there. So um, any, anybody like to ask uh, the panelists some questions? Okay, we have a lot of uh, people uh, expressing their, their support for what you were saying uh, at PESI there and uh, thanking, thanking the panelists. 
Okay, so... Um, <clears throat> Leon Venola has raised her hand. Okay. Venola, please do, please do come in with your question. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you to all the panelists that um, created such a beautiful uh, intersection, interlinkages, uh, interplay of all the, the findings. Um, you did a great job and did justice to to what the, the 67 projects found. Um, I think also agree with um, with Rona that this is really just the beginning. And I would like to appeal for us to to have to see this as a, as as a base research and to continue now to see um, what the impact to continue to follow and walk alongside the projects and to see what the longer term and medium term impact is of our work. And I think that is where we'll really see the impact and our reflections might be different from today. Um, and we might find something much more deeper. So I would like us to continue and um, stay together as a family and um, see how we can take forward because this is the pathway to dealing with climate justice. This is the pathway to dealing with pollution and um, destruction of the earth by, by the industries. Um, so thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Venola, and also for your outstanding work in, in, uh, in the Thousand Woman uh, projects, which we've heard a little bit about today. And if you haven't seen uh, Venola's video, please do take a look. Um, but we actually have uh, one or two questions uh, beforehand that were, uh, that were uh, prepared beforehand, but we've got one here from uh, Marlon. Uh, Lee Moncrief. Uh, Marlon, you're very welcome. It's lovely to see you. And uh, Marlon, like Rona, is a very keen cyclist. I know that. Um, so, but I, I don't think you're, this question is about cycling. He's asking, I may have missed it, but has co creation, project co creation, occurred in any cross cultural projects between countries using arts based uh, methodologies? Um, so, I think that the short answer to that question, Marlon, uh, is unfortunately um, we were a little bit limited through the COVID pandemic for that kind of cross-country uh, uh, collaboration, but uh, we're very much hoping in the next phase to generate that. And uh, one example is in work around using arts-based methods uh, in relation to gender-based uh, violence. Um, but I think, um, you know, that's, that's something that is very dear to your own heart, I know, Marlon, from your own work. Um, so, um, yeah, that's a very, very good, very good point. I'm not sure if any, any of the project teams or any, any of the hub leads would like to respond to that Marlon's question. Okay, well, maybe we can we can take take that forward. So I think the short answer is that uh, Raphael, please go. Yeah, down. thanks. I, I mean, I think where some of this cross national work has been taking place has really been in the synthesis and in the uh, you know we, we've got a, a number of uh, synthesized outputs looking across projects, and I think that's where the more of the international um, collaborative work has been uh, taking place. Thank you, Raphael. Thank you, Leon. I've just come in there. Yeah, thanks for that. I just, yeah, the idea of a South-South knowledge economy development through these projects will bring lots of richness, you know, in terms of um, taking the lead um, um, and sort of showing the global North that, that there is rich depth of knowledge in, 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 in the global South that can be drawn upon rather than the other way around. So yeah, just, just a, um, a, a general question. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. All right, thanks very much, uh, Marlon. So um, I think um, at this point, maybe um, uh, Rosie, we can we can move on to the next uh, next part of the the uh, the uh, session.